Good morning, church. How are you? All right. Welcome to worship. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that. And thank you for being here today, whether you're in person with us or watching online. A few quick church life updates for you as we get started. Uh, my name is Reverend Jessica Shine, and I serve as the associate minister here. <clears throat> and um, we have some fun things. Jenny uh, Sellers is coming up to tell us about the bell choir. I'm just teasing you. Don't, <laughs> don't walk in church late. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So the bell choir will be starting up soon. I was like, okay, Jenny, I can tease Jenny. Uh, the bell choir will be starting up soon, and we're excited about that. So if you'd like to participate, uh, please talk with Jennifer. Kids Community is also starting next week. Next Sunday, September 11th, we are, um, we are inviting you to celebrate with us Welcome Sunday. So there will be a lot happening. We're starting the church year off. Kids community will be beginning. And if you would like to volunteer to connect with some of our kids, uh, please talk to Gretchen or send her an email. Also, Beth Pfeiffer will be preaching next week. Beth is one of our seminarians. Beth's over on the, the semi section there. There you go, you got a little prep applause. You didn't even say anything yet. <laughs> so you're talking to friends, just remember that, yeah. We, we are a very blessed church that we um, are in covenant with four seminarians. So I love to give them an opportunity to give other folk an opportunity to preach and to practice uh, presenting the word. And so Beth has graciously agreed to kick off our church year uh, with us next week, along with some wonderful music. And Beth has just completed a clinical pastoral education, which is required for ministers and has started an internship at Willamette University, so she's squeezing us in. So make sure you come next week and offer an amen while she's preaching. Uh, also wanna remind you that there will be potluck next week. So remember the church survey that y'all filled out? Dan uh, Close, our moderator, will be sharing the results with us next week after church along with a potluck. So please bring a dish that will feed 10 to 12 people. And uh, if you're a college student, sure, chips and salsa counts. But for the rest of us, uh, casserole or something that can be brought downstairs before worship. Also wanna let you know that this coming week, in case there's a pastoral need, please reach out to Dan Close, our moderator. He's gonna be taking that while I get to enjoy a few days of vacation. Also, uh, Mark Lindbergh, our youth minister, is starting up faith explorations this fall. So if your student is interested in learning more or deepening their faith or just has questions, this is a great season. You'll want to connect with Mark about that. And at the end of September, we will be hosting many of our friends from around the conference for Central Pacific Annual Gathering. If you haven't been to Annual Gathering before, it's a wonderful time for us to connect with other churches, to hear about what ministries uh, are happening there, and to fellowship together and to be encouraged. So everyone is welcome to participate in annual gathering you'll see those in our daily emails and you're welcome to register online for that um, and if you're volunteering to help thank you in advance if it's your first time here today we'd like to invite you to fill out one of these blue cards and place it in the offering plate today we'd love to connect with you get to know who you are and uh, we promise not to spam you but fill this out if it's your first time and drop it in the offering plate by the way the offering is going to be a little bit earlier today than usual um, it'll be right before the sermon and after the prayer response. So we're making a little bit of an adjustment there. I was super excited to share this passing of the peace with you today. And so I'm really curious to see how many of you are tuned in to the season that we're in. So in your bulletin, you'll see the call and response that we use for the passing of the peace. But uh, I'll, just, I'll just share it with you and we'll see how many of you are, are tuned in. May the fourth be with you. <laughs> there you go, there you go, there you go. May the peace of Christ be with you. So glad that you're here today. Please stand as Todd Chapman leads in our call to worship. Beloved of God, welcome. Welcome to this place of love and grace. Welcome to this place of hope and perseverance. God invites all of us to be the beloved community. God invites all of us to share in the good news. 
We are welcome just as we are. We are loved just as we are. In gratitude for all of this, let us worship God. the gospel today is from Luke 14, 25 through 35. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear.
This prayer offering is inspired by poet Alok Manan. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. O oh, dreamer, infinite and everlasting, by what name shall we call you? You gave Moses the words, I am that I am. Indigenous peoples gave us great spirit. We do feel the wind of your spirit blowing through us. We could call you infinite love or eternal mystery. We may say, I and thou. Could we say you and me for intimacy? Be with us here in this moment. Be in our minds that we may comprehend a bit of what you are. Be in our hearts that we may respond to who you are. Enter our souls that we without any doubt can say I and thou, you and me, and know your presence. We are grateful that once again you have offered us this new day as an incredible gift to unwrap and enjoy. Not a blank slate waiting to be filled, but a treasure chest beckoning to be explored. Thank you that this day holds the glorious joy of your presence and the reassuring promise of your will. Help us to hold each new experience as a precious jewel to marvel at and delight in. For this is the day you made. From the rising of this morning sun to its setting, may you be praised as we rejoice and are glad in it. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me as we hope in your steadfast love and pray today for those experiencing suffering and loss, those living in darkness. Our prayers that the glowing ember of spirit is dancing and weaving your kindling flame of love into the shadows of fear that lead to destruction, discord, division, fanning light and hope that moves us towards a compassion that is witness to our mutual interconnectivity as we deepen our knowing of peace as healer. And dreamer, creator, rather than normalize being told who we are by external societal constructs, may we all be in transition, witnessing and loving each other's continual becoming, dancing along our unique journeys to infinite destinations. May we love each other in ways that allow for a great revealing of our true selves. This morning, we lift up Shane Craft, our young church friend who delighted in the wonders of Camp Adams last weekend as he recovers from a recent medical procedures with hopes for his continued courage on his journey towards healing and blessings to his family as they offer love and strength. As Shane would say with exuberant glee, that's what I'm talking about. God, we beg your blessing for the continued grace you pour into our world as we journey to do your will. Praise God, the healer of the brokenhearted and binder of wounds. We thank you, Great Spirit, that you are always present in our lives. Behind and before us, you walk alongside us every step of our way. Help us stay strong and true to you. Help us not to follow after the voice of the crowds, but to press in close to you, to hear your whispers and seek after you alone. And now, church, please join me as we speak together the words that Jesus brought us as inspired from Aramaic translations. O oh, birther, father and mother of the cosmos, you create all that moves in light. Focus your light within us. Make it useful as the rays of a beacon show the way. From this divine union, let us birth new images for a new world of peace. Help us love beyond our ideals and sprout acts of compassion for all creatures. Grant what we need each day in bread and insight subsistence for the call of growing life. 
Forgive our hidden past, the secret shames, as we consistently forgive what others hide. Deceived neither by the outer nor the inner, free us to walk your path with joy. From you is born all ruling will, the power and life to do, the song that beautifies all from age to age it renews. Amen. Ushers are, are receiving your offerings, and I just want to say thank you so much for your support. Thank you for your love for this church. Um, you probably remember us mentioning earlier in the summer that we were going through another facilities manager transition. Uh, Evan, who had been serving with us, found a, a position that aligned more with his calling. And so we've been going through the search process, but I just want to say thank you to the facilities team and to so many of you who just step in the gap there and show your love for the church and this building. And um, so many of you, uh, Jim Weston, you know, is climbing on the roof, digging things up. Trish is making phone calls. Uh, others are doing different things, but helping to share uh, some of the care of this place. And so thank you for the ways that you make that happen. Thank you for the ways that you support the ministries of this church, not just the physical building, but all of the ways that we can show up in community together. So I just want you to know that we are deeply grateful for each of you, and thank you for your offerings. Thank you, Barb. All right, church, you ready? Okay. So the ushers, did you all get a piece of paper that looks like this? You gotten that? Not yet? Okay. If you guys want to pass those out, you can. You'll need that later on. No homework, I promise. We'll take care of it all today. In the late 90s, the film The Titanic features an epic goodbye scene. You can tell what kind of service this is going to be. 
The ship has struck an iceberg, it's split, debris litters the open ocean. And as the camera pans back, we see our two characters saying their fateful goodbye. Rose and Jack have moments before submerged into the water and suddenly found themselves in frigid water searching for help. They pop up to the surface just in time to see a wood plank floating by. And Rose climbs up on the piece of wood, leaving Jack in the icy water. Now, if you've seen the movie like me, you've probably sat there and thought, is she going to scoot over? <laughs> and if you've seen the movie, you know she doesn't. Now, this movie resurfaced recently, and the internet went crazy. There were people who were criticizing Rose and coming up with all kinds of memes and, and ideas of how this could have ended differently. In fact, an entire meme is dedicated to showing the various positions that Rose and Jack could have both fit on this plank so that they could have both survived. Another critic writes, Rose clearly moved on from Jack's demise, remarried, lived happily ever after, and yet no one would compare to those two days of romance with Jack Dawson. <laughs> Grief does that. Grief distorts our view. Grief clouds our ability to see. It clouds our ability to see rescue or help on the way, or maybe even an alternate ending to the story. Grief can change the way we see things. It can even change the way we see ourselves. It keeps us in a haze. And in Luke chapter 14, Jesus' followers have grown to a crowd. Maybe some of them are there for good sermons. Maybe some are there for good food. Maybe some are there to be healed. Maybe some have come because they found community, maybe for the first time. And maybe some are there because they hunger and thirst for justice. For whatever reason, the crowds have swelled. And it's in this setting that Jesus makes a strange invitation. In verses 26 and 27, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What is Jesus talking about? What I think Jesus is saying to us today is that change is real. And with change comes grief. Grief comes even in the midst of excitement about the future. Not that following Jesus requires us to hate people. Don't worry, that's not what this sermon is about today. Uh, in my opinion, that's ridiculous uh, jargon from people who are more interested in piety than in people. Jesus isn't saying, I want you to go out and hate each other. He's just saying things will change if you choose to follow me. And just so you know, when things change, you may feel some grief. It means things and people and we ourselves change. Jesus is elevating the reality that being a disciple means we will sometimes grieve because grief takes us to seasons where we feel crazy. We may not even feel connected to the people who are closest to us, the people who love us the most, because grief creates that cloud around us that we literally cannot see through. Grief keeps us in this fear that something will change while simultaneously limiting our ability to see that everything has changed, including us. And we're there, aren't we, church? Grief reveals itself in the emotions that surface when we aren't ready to move on from a job, a relationship, or even a good TV series. Grief is when we realize that where we're at isn't where we expected to be. It's why Jesus goes on in verses 28 and 30 and says, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? What if you lay the foundation and you aren't able to finish it? Then everyone who sees it will walk by and ridicule you 
and say, that person wanted to build, but they weren't able to finish. I would say to you today that Jesus is extending this invitation because grief needs to be named. Jesus is asking the question, what if it doesn't turn out like you hoped? Then what? Are you prepared for that? The parts of our life that we're asked to leave behind, the ideas that no longer serve us, the language and ways of being that limit our capacity to grow. Imagine walking into Jerry's or to your favorite home improvement store and walking up to the attendant and say, I've got to build a project. And the attendant says, great, what can I help you build? And you say, I don't know. You can imagine at first the attendant, especially if it's someone like Susie Leo, is going to say, okay, well, let's talk this out. Let's figure it out. What are are you thinking? What are you feeling? Tell me about your home. Tell me about where you live. And all the while, they're trying to coax this dream out of you, and still, you're stumped. I don't actually know. Surely the attendant would wait with you for a while. And eventually they would say, you know, I've got other customers I need to attend to, other other people who have more clarity. Maybe when you're clear about what you need, maybe when you can name it, come back and I can be of help then. Grief needs to be named or it will disrupt life in other ways. As chaplains, There was a saying in my CPE, my clinical pastoral education, that grief manifests itself in one of two ways. If you don't grieve, it will come out in tears or heart attacks. Grief has to be named or it will disrupt life. Grief must be named so that it can also be felt. This is why Jesus makes radical statements, because he's inviting us to count the cost before we make the purchase, before we sign the contract, before we say yes, to count the cost and to say, what if it doesn't go the way you want? Will you still stay connected? What does counting the cost mean? I think in this passage, it's the invitation to move from our analyzing and assessing brain into our heart space because grief has to be named so that it can be felt. Counting the cost is the invitation to say, are you willing to feel things more deeply? Are you willing to move out of the coulda, woulda, shoulda, out of the blame brain and out of the analyzing and into the heart space where you can just sit there and feel? Counting the cost means you consider what's really going to be asked of you and those who follow after you. We can't move forward with one boat in the past and one foot in the boat of the future. Counting the cost involves grieving together so that we can grow together. Counting the cost means taking into consideration your own needs for the journey and also those who will come after you. And sometimes it means making decisions so their journey will be simpler. Sometimes counting the cost means making room for people who don't even know we exist yet. One church that I served with said, we believe so strongly in community that we're counting the cost of what it means to be community and they replaced their pews with padded interlocking chairs because for them, counting the cost meant that sanctuary wasn't just a space of connectivity, but it was also one of mobility. And they didn't stop there. They said, counting the cost means we're not gonna produce a bunch of waste as we make this remodel. So they found businesses and other congregations who were in need of those materials. And as they were giving them away, they had a ceremony of blessing. Counting the cost means being able to think about those who are with us on the journey. Jesus is inviting us to count the cost of journeying together. Look around. You get to decide who you journey with. Grief must be named so that it can be felt. We're at the end of our summer sabbatical time, and some griefs have surfaced. It's important that we name them and we feel them. I mentioned to you that we'll hear the survey results after worship next week at Potluck. And some of us, if you're like me, you want to jump to dreaming and planning and figuring out what we do next. 
And that's going to be crucial, don't get me wrong. But I believe Jesus is making the invitation in this passage for us to pause before we jump to the planning and to count the cost, to assess where we're at, to remember our ancestors and those who discipled us as well as the new faces and generations who are here with us. Anyone want to skip grief and go right to the fun planning part? <laughs> yeah, me too. My wife recently bought a garden hose. She's a pretty good gardener, self-taught. And she got one of the big kind of bulky hoses, you know? It looks like it's really gonna be effective because it's a really big hose. And I, I wound it up on, you know, on the little hose rack so it's nice and neat. And she pulled it off the rack one day to water our garden in the backyard. And she found that as she stretched it across the yard that the sun, because of where the sun had hit it, it had, had shaped it. And so the more that she stretched it to the distance that it should be able to go, she found that the hose began to kink. You see, if we don't name our grief and we don't feel our grief, it's not just the grief that can't get through, the joy can't get through either. Healing communities use a word called bypass. Uh, theological communities have coined the phrase spiritual bypass. You may have heard me use that phrase before. Spiritual bypass is when we, we minimize or dismiss or we ignore the grief that someone else or we ourselves are feeling. It's when we do it willfully, willfully or even unintentionally. And as my wife stretched the hose, she noticed that there were these kinks and so she had to do the labor of going back and manually untwisting it and then she would stretch it out again and sure enough, there would be more. So she had to go back to where the last one was until the whole hose had reached its capacity. Spiritual bypass of grief is like trying to water your garden when the hose is kinked. When we don't create room for ourselves to feel and to experience and to name what we've lived through, we also can't make room for the joy. And chances are we get into a rhythm of busyness that won't be helpful for us. So grief must be named and it must be felt. Only then can it be transmuted. By the way, transmuted is just a fancy theological word for transformed. When Christ faces his own grief, he chooses the most common symbols to illustrate the power of transformation. He chooses bread and wine. Not only do we receive these elements so that we may live, but as we chew them physiologically, our bodies break them down. And those tiny molecules will nourish us because unless they're broken down, they won't be metabolized. Grief is the same way. I wonder what grief you bear today or in this season. I wonder in what ways you may have metabolized those griefs or where the invitation may be for you today. In the last church I pastored, I was fortunate enough to serve as a police chaplain. One of the trainings that we received was on death notifications. And death notifications are very sensitive because we learned that what can happen is when you arrive at someone's door, you make a phone call to let someone know that their loved one has died, the shock can overwhelm good people. People who usually have common sense about them completely uh, block out anything else you're saying because the shock. And so what we learned as we were making these death notifications is that a loved one cannot be named as a passing. You have to state it clearly and briefly so that there's space for folk to absorb what you just named. And then you can go into more detail if it's needed. And sometimes all you can do is just repeat it. If you can't name that grief, to facilitate grief, you must name it so it can be felt and then time will help transmute it even if you must name it over and over again. So I wanna do an exercise with you, church. Raise your hand if you've attended this church for 20 years or more. All right, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. I'll make it quick, don't worry, if you gotta switch hands, that's fine too. Keep, raise your hand if you've attended this church for 10 years or longer. All right, raise your hand if you've attended this church for five years or longer. All right, now keep them up. How many of you have started attending since COVID? Okay, keep them up, keep them up. 
Keep your hands up if you've been up so far. Okay. Look around. Not every hand is up, but a lot of hands are up. Okay, go ahead and put them down. Now, raise your hand if you know what the real church is like. <laughs> Jenny Sellers for the win. Jenny's, Jenny's version of First Congregational must be right. Kelsey's version must be right. My version must be right. And yet you all are the church. Your experience of the church is the real experience of the church, which also means that your experience of grief in this church is a real experience of grief. And if you have journeyed together, chances are you have experienced some grief. In our leadership book groups this summer, Pastor Nancy and I began discerning a phenomenon that's been happening. And so we began to name it in those book groups and in other places. So church, I wanna share that with you today. I have some hard news for you. It'll be okay though, okay? I'm gonna share a hard thing with you. The church you knew has died. The church you knew has died. The things we used to do that we no longer do, that's grief and it's okay. The people that we used to see that we no longer see, that's grief and it's okay. I'm sharing that with you because we have to name our grief. We won't be able to dream together about the future if we can't grieve together about what we've lost thus far. And to grieve without shame for grieving. What might you be grieving? What might we be grieving as a church? I've heard it in my conversations with you. I've seen it manifested in various ways. COVID took away the ability to connect with each other over meals and even coffee until recently. We witnessed beloved church members and friends dying, moving away or even moving on. In the midst of all of that, before uh, some of that, a beloved associate minister retired, grief. Before that, another beloved associate minister took another call, grief. What other griefs do you bear as a church? Retiring senior ministers, new senior minister, grief. In order for grief to metabolize, we need to name it, be specific, and to feel it. In that way, we honor the love that we felt, the respect, the dream, and we can become grounded again and recapture our vision for the present time and not simply keep the past alive. So the ushers gave you a piece of paper. I want to invite you to pull it out here. On one side, you'll see the words, stuff we used to do. I'm going to invite you to participate in an exercise here as you come to receive the elements of communion. So there's a pencil. You may have a pen in the rack in front of you. In a moment, I'll invite you to just jot down. Barbara will play some music, and I'll invite you to just recall those things that you miss, things that you may be grieving about stuff that we used to do as a church. Doesn't mean we won't do it again, just you miss it. And then on the other side, you'll see people I miss. I want to invite you to recall those names, those folks that you don't see anymore. We have to name the griefs of what we've hoped for and what we've lost, and sometimes what we will never have again. We are a progressive church, and we are progressing, even as we move through our griefs. When I think about the last few years of myself and my own grief, I think of my abuela. You've heard me talk about her before, my grandmother. That's Spanish for grandmother. And I remember the stuff that Abuela loved. She always, whenever we went out to eat, Abuela had to have a glass of Chardonnay with ice cubes. <laughs> she loved flamboyant bags, flamboyant jewelry. She had long nails. Because, I think because she grew up on a farm. She worked as a, we, you know, our 
uh, ancestors were farmers, um, especially when they came to this country. And so now that she could drive around in her little Cadillac with her long nails, and I remember every road trip, Abuela would be tapping the steering wheel with those nails. And sometimes I catch myself, I don't have nails, but sometimes I catch myself doing it like I saw her do when I was little. She loved, to, she, she never knew the words, but she would always uh, make up notes to Selena or Luis Miguel, if you know those artists. And um, those are the things that she used to love. And I think about those, um, and I think about how much I miss her. Even though I grieve her, she's still with me. She's still a part of me. I believe that in my theology, that she is part of me and with me here. Even though it's different and I won't experience her in the same way. And recently, my uncle brought a bag of mementos and we were sitting at the kitchen table, my wife and I, and the bag was in front of me. It was one of grandma's bags. And I reached into it and as I pulled out some of her mementos, I smelled her. And I lost it. And I just leaned over that bag and closed my eyes. And she was there. And I just sat there for a minute, being reminded that I was still in her presence and she was still in mine. Church, what griefs do you have that need to be named so they can be felt? She is who I miss the most. And you've been through a lot in the last few years, church. There are faces you won't see anymore, fragrances you won't catch on the wind anymore. So why labor? Why try? If, as Jesus says, we may lose everything, if, as Jesus says, we may not have counted the cost, why labor? If, as Jesus says, we may not ever complete that vision, why labor? Why try? I would tell you that we labor today through grief because of love. The poet in 1 Corinthians 13 says, if I speak in the tongue of men and angels but do not have Love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I can speak all prophecies and explain all mysteries to you, if I give my body over to be burned for justice and righteousness sake, but I don't have love, I am nothing. I would say to you today, the reason we labor is because of love. That's why we're here. That's why we move through this grief together. Maybe the greatest act of love you can do for yourself or your church is to make room to grieve together. No, it doesn't make for a good selling point and you probably won't hear it on duck radio. Come grieve with us. But it's necessary work. It's good work and it's sacred work. And grief won't last long. Grief can help clarify our vision. It can help catalyze our hope and can help us remind ourselves of those things that we miss and we actually want to reclaim again or those things that we miss and we can say thank you and let them be. Why labor? Because of love. What are you grieving the most? I want to invite you to take a few moments and write them down. And then we'll lead you in a call and response. And as you're prompted, we'll invite you to come up and receive the emblems. Who are you missing the most? What are you grieving that we may never do again or be again as a church? Together, together we can honor that part of our story. We labor because of love. May it be so.
So the scripture teaches us that Jesus, after he had finished the meal with his friends, took the cup and took the bread, blessed it and broke it, said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and blessed it and said, this is my blood, drink all of it. In a moment, Maxine and Susan, Sherry and Roger will make the emblems available for you to come and receive. Use the outer aisles, you'll be dismissed row by row. And I invite you to come up as you come up by your rows to place your griefs on these pin boards and then come towards the center aisle for your emblems and then return to your seats through the center aisle. Would you join, me with, join with me in the Sacrament of Holy Communion in your bulletin? At Holy Communion, we share a simple meal of bread and wine. Here, we experience the presence of Christ again. Especially in Jesus, we experience our oneness in Christ. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. All are welcome to the table of Christ. All are welcome to receive what has been freely given. So do this in remembrance of Christ. And as you come forward, we invite you to place your griefs.
Is there anyone else who has not received the communion that would like to? We, we can come to you. Okay, great. Thank you all for that. Would you stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, number 247, together? My shepherd is the living God.